Awesome. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our next event with Bruce Wagner with Sam Watson to discuss Bruce's latest novel, The Marvel Universe, Universe Origin Stories. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website by signing up for our email newsletter, as well as following us on social media at BookSoup. Also, we have a YouTube channel, and you can find um, all of our past videos there, our past events. And this is actually our last event for the year, which is exciting. So our next event is not until January 7th at 6 p.m. with Michael Posner in conversation with Robert Fagan to discuss Leonard Cohen, Untold Stories, The Early Years, Volume 1. Tonight's event will end with a Q&A, but you can also ask questions throughout, and you can submit a question with the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. I see that someone has already utilized that space, and Sam will pull your questions from there. And you can do that at any time, and they'll weave them into their conversation. So if you see a question on the list you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the Like button, and we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Also, please support Book Soup and our author this evening by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, which you can do by clicking the green button right below the viewer screen, right above Ask a Question area. And this link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process and it will not interrupt viewing, so you can do that throughout the presentation. And with that said, let me introduce our guest for this evening. But before I do that, sorry, I forgot. Books, I believe, will be signed by Bruce, so you want to take advantage of that with Book Soup. I don't know if you'll be able to get those in other places. So, Bruce Wagner is a novelist and screenwriter. His 2014 film, Maps to the Stars, was directed by David Cronenberg and in competition in the Cannes Film Festival. For her role in the film, Julianne Moore won the Palme d'Or, did I say that correctly? Mm -hmm. For Best Actress. It was her first time receiving that award. Wagner has been nominated for the Penn Faulkner Award and has written for many publications from the New York Times to Art Forum to Vanity Fair. He lives in Boyle Heights. And this is where we will clap in the store. And our other guest speaker for this evening is Sam Wasson, who is the author of many books, including the best-selling Fosse and Fifth Avenue, 5 AM, Audrey Hepburn, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and The Dawn of the Modern Woman. He lives in Los Angeles. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to our guests. Thank you both so much for being with us tonight. Everyone sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Book Soup. This is meaningful to me for a lot of reasons, but I'll give you the top two. One is I love Bruce Wagner. I've loved Wagner my whole life, and I don't need to tell you why you're here so you understand. Um, I, I grew up reading Wagner. I, I will die reading Wagner. And um, I, I hope everyone else dies reading Wagner. Um, and, and maybe even tonight. Um, and, and, Wagner and, will die reading Wagner. <laughs> I, 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 Bruce, um, um, I, 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 I'm a, I, I want to read this one thing about Bruce. Um, um, that I pub that I wrote in airmail when when I was covering the story of um, Marvel Universe, which we'll get into in a second. Um, since the publication of his first novel, Force Majeure, in 1991, Wagner has indisputably secured the title Hollywood novelist of his generation. But I think even that undersells him. To characterize his best work, and the Marvel Universe may be his best work, as Hollywood fiction seems to me about as useful as calling The Great Gatsby a Long Island novel. Wagner writes American novels. They're set in Hollywood for the same reason Thornton Wilder set Our Town in Grover's Corners. This is the way we were, the stage manager says near the end, near the top of Wilder's great play. This is where we were, the way we were in our growing up and in our marrying, and in our living, and in our dying. And all of that comes, I think, into full flower in um, this book, and not for the first time in Bruce's career. I, I do believe um, that this is one of several of Bruce's masterpieces, um, and I'm not alone in thinking that. So what I want to do today, and anyone can chime in at any point, um, but what I want to do is I want to start off with uh, uh, Los Angeles and Bruce's hand that you can see right there. And, and, and some people know about the hand. A lot of people don't know about the hand. 
What's on your hand? This is um, when we did Maps to the Stars, Cronenberg gave uh, some of us a parting gift, and it was a movie star map from 1931, and it was Beverly Hills, and I blew up that section uh, uh, to the streets that I grew up on as a boy, Camden and Rodeo, and uh, this was a little uh, north of where I lived, the wealthy section. The realtors called where I lived uh, Baja, right? So uh, I decided that uh, to put it on my writing hand um, was both pretentious and meaningful. <laughs> meaningful because I, I don't think pretentious. Why, do you regret it? No, not at all. Well, there's yeah. something skeletal about it um, as well, but it's, uh, it's a reminder uh, of, of the, 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 the locus that, that formed me you know, it was um, it was a, a place where um, there was tremendous tumult in my family. It was a place where I became aware of extreme fame and and also outliers in society. Um, it was a, a place where I became aware of celebrity and death, and uh, a place that I continue to live in long after. Um, my my Beverly Hills cell date was was passed, and it's a place that I revisit. Recently, I had a friend that died, and I walked near our our elementary school. He was one of my closest grade school friends, and strolled um, past the the apartment where he lived. This was a a boy that um, we used to steal books. There was a bookstore called Papa Bach on Wilshire Boulevard. And we we loved the owner, but we stole from him. He never knew, you know. And that began began a long career of of working in bookstores and stealing from bookstores. <laughs> Do you remember the moments like the these these? Uh, were, did you perceive as traumatic the moments when you became aware of celebrity uh, death and outsiders? Do you actually remember those moments? Yeah, um, I mean, we we lived a uh, house down from Broderick Crawford. Uh, he was on the skids by then. Um, we, I went to school with a lot of television stars, kids that would come straight from the set still in costume that I was insanely envious of, you know, that I wanted to be. Um, a little older than I were people like Richard Dreyfus and Liz Taylor's kids went to my, my grade school. Um, but Broderick Crawford was married to a woman named Joan Tabor, who was a, a starlet and uh, they divorced uh, it was a, a rocky marriage and uh, she died she overdosed and died in a, a, a shabby apartment on doheny drive um, not far from where we lived but um, worlds away because it was a, a, a street of apartment houses and, and duplexes um, i also later worked uh, as a limousine driver for the beverly hills hotel and uh, had all kinds of, of people. I had mafiosi, I had um, legendary celebrities like Audrey Hepburn. Um, I had wannabes and, and pimps and- And you know, Orson. Back... Eh? And Orson Welles. And Orson Welles, yeah. Um, so I, I was keenly aware, you know, I, I, I feel that um, one is not so much shaped as one is um, somehow, uh, uh, one's DNA uh, flowers uh, in in that that place where one is raised. You know, um, I've said before that you know people say, would James Elroy have have written about um, murder uh, had his mother not been murdered? And I feel yes. Um, would I have um, have written about uh, celebrity and death and and a kind of spirituality? I think yes. But I was fortunate enough to have my environment enhance and almost extract those things from me. So why do you think yes? Well. Um, there's something very operatic about my nature. Um, there's a theatricality about it. 
there's a um, almost a sentimentality, although among some of my auteur friends, that's an, an obscenity, that particular word. Um, my One of my favorite authors is Dickens, who has been accused of uh, sentimentality. I'm certainly not comparing myself to him. But there's a, a, a kind of melancholy and a... a um, a keening towards transcendence that uh, feels uh, right for me. It feels natural for me. A sense of drama um, and a sense of um, the kind of cosmic joke that we are born into. Um, uh, and the 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 punchline um, is uh, is death. Is that funny enough for you, Sam? Is that uh, good enough? Hilarious. <laughs> I, I'm I, should say, I don't know if they mentioned The Big Goodbye, this extraordinary book you wrote. I, I thought she might have omitted it uh, about the making of Chinatown. Right. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. I'm glad you said transcendence about your own work because this is, I think, one of the things, one of the many things that sets you apart from the novelists that I think you are very favorably, but not, um, um, not satisfyingly compared to the LA novelists that precede you, like, you know, famously uh, Nathaniel West and all these guys, you know, Nathaniel West and um, uh, Chandler, all these guys who finally didn't transcend mm. and whose characters never transcend. And, and, and because of it, they send this message of ugliness about this city or they perpetuate this message of failure, which is mm. not is irrelevant to the story of Los Angeles, but I believe your work uh, is endures and transcends actually because of the presence of transcendence. Well, I'm hoping because um, I, I felt my my work was misread or misunderstood early on, that I was considered to be the the king of the hill of of um, nihilism or cynicism. And that's something that uh, offended me, you know. Um, a deeper reading, I am hoping, would demonstrate that um, that I'm slouching toward um, a kind of Bethlehem, you know what I mean? And uh, that, that holy city um, is one of um, transcendence, where uh, the, 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 the tragic comic foibles of human beings are placed in a, uh, uh, a a different light. That there is a, a kind of gravitas um, that I wanted to uh, unfurl or establish, because the alternative, simply being a catalog of despair, a catalog resume of of horror and and um, and degradation, did not hold any appeal uh, for me. Um, and, and it's germane in the sense that, um, you know, the reason we are here uh, is because this book was initially turned down by a publisher uh, here in Los Angeles for the very reason that he felt I was defaming or shaming certain aspects of society. Um, he went so far as to tell me that my characters couldn't even go there let alone the the creator or the channel so, so those tell that story go so 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 let's let's go to marvel universe then before you get into the publishing give us just the, the seed the 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 smithy as my friend says where this thing started in you emotionally um i will and, and i i the this this little riff began um with with my words but uh, to wrap around, uh, I I have uh, I write about nothing but outsiders and outliers because I have felt that of myself in so many ways, and I was essentially um, accused and and censored by uh, a publisher, which had never happened to me. This is my twelfth book. Um, uh, he, he, uh, I have a character in the Marvel Universe whose name is Joan Gamma. She's uh, an orphan. She's um, 500 pounds when we meet her at the beginning of the book, uh, slouching toward 1,000. That is her goal. Um, she's fetishized uh, weight gain. 
And there is a, a real character on social media who called, calls himself the fat Jew or the fat Jewish. She's a huge fan of his and calls herself the fat Joan. Um, in my first conversation and last conversation with the editor and publisher, he said that a character could not call herself that. It was fat shaming, essentially. So you can imagine, um, knowing my work, which uh, he had told me he was very familiar with um, before I signed the contract and was thrilled that I was publishing with him. You can imagine what followed. Uh, the conversation was not that long, maybe 20 minutes, um, with me mostly um, not so much uh, expressing outrage as um, being nonplussed. Uh, in other words, I directly said to him, what were you thinking in publishing me? You know, and my, my, imagine, uh, my imagination tells me um, that he suddenly thought, having read an early excerpt of the book, that still was controversial by his standards, that he would he was going to get a manuscript that would be could be serialized in the New Yorker. That somehow I was going to transform into uh, someone other than who I was, you know. But I think the thing that that was most disturbing is um, the gloss that he glossed over the notion that I do attempt, whether I succeed or fail, to write about the great beauty. Um, in ugliness and the great beauty in uh, the insecurities uh, that we all carry with us. And I have written uh, of people uh, about persons of all color, uh, all genders, uh, mutilated people, deformed people, uh, obese people, um, dying people, um, children who are dying. So I, I do cover the waterfront and that suddenly I was being told um, that I could not say certain things. I mean, my friend, uh, he said that uh, the language was problematic. That was the first phrase, which is chilling. You know, it's, it's something that they tell you before you, you're ushered into an internment camp. My friend uh, David Cronenberg so aptly said that telling a writer that his language is problematic is like telling a lover that you don't like his or her flesh, you know. So um, we, we came full circle, and you had read the manuscript early on. I'm thrilled that we're um, selling this through Book Soup and Book Soup only. It comes full circle for me because my career, such as it is, began at Book Soup 1988 with a, a chapbook almost, a, a, a little book called Force Majeure, the Bud Wiggins stories. We published a, a thousand copies and sold it exclusively out of book soup and, and sold out. And based on that little book, I, um, I got a, a deal with Random House and published the novel version of that. Um, so I'm very, very happy, uh, not just to be here with you, my, my dear and old friend, but to have come full circle this way. That's so meaningful to me. I'm glad you brought that up. I would have brought it up if you hadn't. And to be talking with you, who was in a way born at Book Soup, talking uh, to all of to, to 116 people uh, who who are Book Soup lovers and supporters, and to be um, promoting this book, which really is only available for purchase at Book Soup. Um, it feels good to be home in a way, uh, especially when um, we all miss each other and well, miss being in Book Soup. The most compelling thing I should add is that when this book, this manuscript was rejected, I had two choices. I could um, find another publisher. Now, in the best of circumstances, if this publisher here in LA had loved the book, it would be published either around this time next year or right. in spring of 2022. Right. It would have been more likely to be summer or winter of 2022 because I would have had to search for a publisher. And usually it takes about a year once a book is designed, typeset, manuscript galleys, etc. cetera. Um, so that was one choice. It didn't look good for me as a choice. The other choice was to publish the book myself. So suddenly I started looking into that and talking to people and they said, well, you know, the books are published in Iceland or China, you know, 
This book is published here in the United States, isn't it, Sam? Yep. Yeah. So that suddenly I was in book world. I was suddenly a publisher. Mm -hmm. That's when I said, fuck you all. I'm mm -hmm. going to release this book onto the internet for free. I'm going to release it into the public domain. In other words, I didn't want to do something Louis C.K. style where I release a book and it's $2.99, you know, or it's only $3.99. And or one ninety nine, you know, and I the idea uh, it was a, a a short learning arc for me because, you know, a year ago the idea of of you know someone telling me, some fortune teller, you you are going to be releasing your next book on the internet for free into the public domain, it just I wouldn't have I would have said what there is no possibility of that, and uh, people quickly came around people that felt oh. This is so sad, you know, Bruce is releasing his book on the internet, how awful. They quickly came around and understood what, uh, what this was about. Um, I, uh, the book is in the public domain, which means there is no physical copy of the book except what you're doing. There, there are some, uh, I'm not saying this uh, for competition because your book is stunning, it's an art piece. There is, you can get the book on the internet on demand because there are people that thrive on printing you can anything you can that's in the public domain. Now, right? Say Anyone, the, because the rights are available. The rights, the uh, someone domain. could make a movie of this. Yeah. I have no participation uh, in profits whatsoever, none. And this was so liberating for me, Sam, so deeply liberating that I now, um, you know, I, I, I didn't even have a website. I released it on my website. And uh, the, the idea of doing that, I've gotten, I've gotten notes from very well-known reviewers uh, yet to review the book. I'm not sure if it will be reviewed, but um, who just contacted me directly, went around my, my book agent. I get notes from fans because my, my email address is is on the website. So in, in one fell swoop, I somehow was able to junk this, what had become for me an archaic and dangerous vehicle, which was traditional publication. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to do this with my next book. That is not my plan. But for this one, in this time, particularly with the pandemic uh, and people locked down, um, I thought, how how extraordinary to simply press send that's why we call it press send press how extraordinary to 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 for an author who's essentially been executed i mean the the if we if if i had not done that and and then you had had not written about it beautifully uh, in airmail and then decided to to publish this um, I would be, uh, I don't know if I'd be moping, but I would certainly have had many conversations with people where they're saying, I thought you were working on a book, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, well, I, I was, I finished it, but I'm not sure what's happening with it. I'm, I had some problems, with, you know, that sort of absolutely stultifying and, and uh, disheartening um, dialogue I heard in my head, you know? I do. Yeah. And I want to, I want to just go just because, because there's no audience reaction. So I can't, it's, it's impossible to know if people really got the absolute strange love esque ridiculousness of what Bruce experienced. It was a fictional character. Okay. I'm, I'm risking being didactic to drive home this point. This is a fictional character who is 500 pounds aiming for a thousand, who calls herself fat. Well, it's even more than that because she's a comical character, tragic comic, and calls herself the Fat Joan lightheartedly and as an homage to uh, uh, someone who calls himself the Fat Jew. So yeah. it's even it's even beyond that, you know. Um, it's so separating. I mean, she's, she is like all of your characters, even in their extremity real and so when you read that well it doesn't even register because of course it's just fat i mean it's not even like the reader 
gets to that point and goes, Oh, she calls it. It's just one of the words, one of the thousand words on the page. Yeah, it's essentially um, these are our crumbs uh, on the table uh, because the culture now or, uh, or a, a, a section of the culture um, is uh, sensitized to the point of delirium, you know, and blindness. Uh, so all of the nuances, the niceties uh, are now threatened. Uh, and uh, that's the, the more disturbing uh, factor um, because I, I told you that you quoted that in the article, all of my work would have been uh, destroyed. It would have been uh, thrown into the fern furnace. You know, Fahrenheit 451 is no joke, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, that was, uh, again, the idea of a writer being unable to publish a book and then releasing that book into the public domain um, was liberating for me because uh, I was telling you some people eventually came around uh, and uh, what was I protecting by resisting that thought? You know, my precious career, you know, money. Uh, well, no, I, I, my, my, I haven't made money in years from books. Uh, it, it's, it, you know, uh, I turn to you for, to ask you for money. <laughs> no, uh, my, my, my books um, are not bestsellers, and, you know, you, you can make a modest living. Um, but if it takes you three years to write a book, that modest living becomes um, uh, subsistence, you know. So I make my... The, my income from movies and, and, and writing scripts. Um, so that's the, the, the interesting um, thing about the trajectory of, of this book is that by, by releasing it into the public domain, um, one, a, a burden somehow is, is taken from one. It's in the ether now. And it, it doesn't matter if anyone reads it or doesn't. It's, uh, I've experienced something uh, that I've never uh, experienced before as well. This is the only book that I've written that will never go out of print, you know? I mean, for some symbolically and literally, it will always be in print. Uh, so it, it's, it's been a um, kind of a glorious, um, unexpected thing. I like to say that the road narrows, and we're used to saying that that's not a good thing, the road narrows. No, often in life, the road narrows until there is one choice, and if you're fortunate, it is the one right choice. So I felt that the road narrowed enough for me that, um, that this was the result. And there's also something about, well, introduce readers a little bit to the world of the book, because I, I think that also... Um, plays a part in why publishing it the way you have feels so right. I think um, because of the, um, the, 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 the now of this book to just take it yeah, away. My, my, my books are always uh, au courant, you know, they're, they're very much of the time. And I remember even uh, when I was publishing my books um, in the, the galleys, I would have to make certain changes because those who I mentioned were were it wasn't appropriate anymore. They either something had happened to them, um, uh, they had died, or something was amiss. So I had to change that. And I think there's a there were two schools of critics. One school thought that this can't be literature because Wagner is um, writing too much in the present. But if you look at all at many books, including Dickens, you'll find yeah. real personages that no one knows, knows who they are and no one cares who they are. So, but that was part of my, um, my, um, my, my joy, my joie de vivre, you know what I mean? Uh, it, to, to make something that was so, so much of this moment, um, almost journalistically so, and yet, uh, through a poetic lens on a good day, um, that to me had a kind of permanence to it. Um, so that was that was what's always excited me. And Marvel Universe um, 
you know, is I, I adore the title, um, uh, and I'm not saying that um, self-congratulatorily. Uh, it, it, the title came to me, and titles come to me in a certain way that they feel absolutely right, um, and they they become almost an engine that pulls me through the book. So the Marvel Universe, uh, there's a, a beautiful title, a Russian novel, um, called This Fierce and Beautiful World. And the Marvel Universe means to, to tell that. It's not the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And origin stories, um, as a corollary to that, uh, is, is true as well. Because I, I tell the stories of a disparate group of people in three books that are interlocking. Uh, in that way, it's a throwback to books that I wrote such as uh, I'm Losing You and Still Holding. Um, and uh, each book has a denouement and a, and a, a kind of um, uh, operatic uh, quality to it. Uh, and and uh, most everyone in the book winds up knowing one another. At least the reader finds that out. Um, so, yes, the idea of waiting two years to do that, you know, particularly I was talking about permanence, which is an absurd word in, uh, in itself that has no meaning in this impermanent world, which the lessons uh, of the pandemic have, have shown us. Um, I think that uh, I would be as unlikely to have believed a year and a half ago or a year ago that I was releasing a book into the public domain, as many uh, would have reacted to being told, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be on lockdown in your home looking for toilet paper. I mean, you know, so the world is mysterious, unpredictable, violent, transcendent, and marvelous. And the idea of waiting seemed such a, a dusty, um, arthritic way of going about this. And the, the release of a book is, is always a burst of energy for the author, you know. Um, but uh, with this, I, I'm not doing something that I did when I was um, younger, calling the agent. Uh, the New York Times has the book. When is the review coming? Um, who else is reviewing it? Waiting for those those emails or phone calls that, oh, the Atlantic Monthly is reviewing it and it's wonderful or it's shit. You know what I mean? I'm out of all of that. I can't tell you, Sam. You know what free. I mean? It, free. I'll use the F word. Yeah. You are free. Yeah. And, and uh, fat. I'm yeah. getting fat. <laughs> Wagner dared call himself when you're talking about the COVID weight gain. He dared. Yeah. You know, what can I say? No, but it does invite, I mean, for all of the transcendent aspects of the title, which refers literally to the Marvel, the true Marvel universe, yeah. it does invite uh, the less marvelous Marvel universe of the comic book world that we all have crammed into our faces and mm. down our throats every day. So is that... A part to what extent is that a part of this story? Um, you know, in the story, uh, I have characters that I have a woman that is an extra on Marvel movies. I have a little girl who is um, uh, mixed race, schizophrenic, who uh, is uh, is obsessed with. Um, uh, Marvel movies and feels that she is um, uh, the little girl in in a Marvel movie that is um, is not quite human, you know. So I I I I do that is interwoven into the book, but I am uh, I'm not a detractor of those movies, you know. I mean, I actually go and see them because they. Uh, I'm always someone that needed some sort of stimulants, you know. Not so much anymore. Um, to calm himself, and Marvel movies, I'll, I'll show up, uh, or used to, when we still had theaters, uh, on a Saturday at nine in the morning, you know, um, I saw Endgame, and uh, at maybe seven in the morning, because they were playing it around the clock, um, so it's, it's, 
it's really a half homage and uh, but mostly it's not an indictment but the those movies um, and the internet uh, became um, a virus that there there was no vaccine for yeah know? yep and and um, you know from uh, I, I remember there was a, a woman who was dying and she was uh, she was old she was uh, in her 40s no she was old and she her last request before Endgame came out I remember reading this was to see an, an advance and so the studio set up a screening for it so there's these pornographic ideas of how mythology which is urgent and always important and eternal for human beings that is in our dna the 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 grandiosity of myth um how that permeated our culture in in ways that were crassly commercial you know I, that sounds like an indictment to me well you know that word has been uh, not to be used, Sam. We don't use that word indictment. All right. I, 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 th I thought it was an aria of hate and rage. <laughs> um, but I'm also, I think, uh, I'm less evolved. I know I'm less evolved than Bruce because one of the things I do go to your books for is a, a, a Chay Chayefsky like exorcism uh, of the cultural demons. And I know I don't want to emphasize that there is the transcendent part. But it would not be Wagner if you did not if 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 you did if you omitted that um, ride through hell, which is not hellish to read. In fact, is actually beautiful to read, and that's what keeps you coming. What keeps me, one of the things that keeps me coming back is that there, this is not sadistic writing but it is sadistic material mm. and uh that that's um the the filth out of which these these flowers blossom sam this is the most romantic thing you've ever said to me <laughs> call me later <laughs> <laughs> so, so i i uh, you, Do you people are, are, are people sending hey, you hold on hold on i can uh, click the ask a question button all right. Um, all right. Good. Good ones. Okay. Question. Has your journey from Beverly Hills to Boyle Heights been reflected in your writing? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I first lived in Boyle Heights um, 30 years ago, and uh, I was looking for uh, an industrial space. And so I live in a building that that has a lot of very large industrial spaces. And I lived there for three or four or five years and then life intervened. And um, after I, I came back from, um, from Toronto, we were, we were making maps to the stars, I needed a place to stay. I was staying in the guest house of a friend of mine and I, I called that place and there, were, there was nothing available. Um, and then a year later there was. Boyle Heights for me, um, you know, I'm I'm I do a lot of traveling in in my my truck. I'm I'm pretty much um, drive everywhere, and I like Boyle Heights not just because of the neighborhood, um, but it's it's a a good nexus. The place where I live feels kind of like a fortress of solitude. It's very quiet, and from there, I'm right off the five. I can go anywhere. Um, so I'm I'm not like a a, a a community figure there, you know, and um, uh, but I I do uh, adore that list, hearing trains at night, which is something that um, is really lovely. Uh, as a boy, huh? I'm sorry, Bruce. Has it got? Keep going. I'm well, as a boy, I in Beverly Hills, we had a train, you know, that you can still see the tracks. So you could hear the train and see the train, you know, um, and and now in Boyle Heights, you hear the train that that lonely, um, melancholy musical um, sound of the horn, you know, as it as it uh, goes through crossing gates. 
um, that's lovely uh, to 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 walk around uh, the parks there are there are parks that are lovely in Boyle Heights and it's just close to um, to places that I, I find myself in sections of Los Angeles but Los Angeles really broke open for me as a as an ambulance driver when I was 18. I had dropped out of high school and started driving an ambulance for Schaefer Ambulance over on Western and Beverly Boulevard. And I was stunned uh, at Los Angeles. The, you know, th this was a Beverly Hills boy. You know, I never went uh, east of downtown. The most daring thing I, I would do was get on a bus and go to Pickwick Books in Hollywood. Uh, and one time down to a store called Acres of Books in Long Beach, where you had to wear hard hats. The, the bookshelves were so high. So the, uh, the idea of, of me suddenly in passing through towns or being called to go to towns with the name of Vernon or commerce or industry, you know, was just startling. And there was a real empty um, beauty to the city late at night, uh, an anonymity to it. Um, uh, I, one of my, my oldest fantasies as a boy was, was to be a... Um, a transient, you know, and to be, you know, I think uh, of my generation still left over from the beats. There was the idea of, of, of train hopping, you know, you know to, to be going from one anonymous American city to the next. And um, it, it, there was something so achingly beauty, beautiful about it. There was a real sacredness to me. Uh, to Los Angeles, the windy, you know, the windblown beating heart of Los Angeles, you know. So that was a massive discovery. You know. That sounds like noir to me. That's how I understand it. Mm. I, I, I love this this question. I have to read. Um, um, wait, I'm scrolling. Is this the Mothers Against Profanity crowdcast? Is one question. I love that. I just wanted to acknowledge that from a fellow named Jimmy. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, you're safe here. Um, there's another question. Um, it's a long one. Uh, I'm reading it before I finish reading the question. So we're going to be in this together. Um, nihilism and transcendentalism. It seems that you as a writer have a cynical slash skeptical view of human nature that you repeatedly overcome in your prose to create these moments of beautiful transcendence. Mm. Uh, it seems more plausible than sunny spirituality like revelation should be hard won through defeat of your own disposition. Thoughts? Well, I think for the most part that's accurate, you know. Um, I think that uh, my, my personality is that of a catastrophic depressive, you know. Uh, my upbringing was in a very chaotic alcoholic home, and... Um, I had to be both. I had to expect the worst, and yet I was always yearning for and expecting the best. In other words, that there would be peace, and I would find that on certain days that was true. So I, I began ping-ponging between the two, and much of my work is cathartic because I do imagine the worst. I go to the absolute depths, the depths Places that, that, you know, I remember once I was on a, a ketamine journey, um, guided, you know, um, and I, I, I got a shot of ketamine and it was, um, suddenly I was in uh, a room of a mansion, you know, there are many mansions and this was a, a room and a voice told me, not to go there because not even God who made that room goes there, you know? And I was there, I went into the room and uh, one of the, the um, that, that, that particular drug, those are short lived, you know, um, I've, uh, in the past, this was a long time ago, I avoided um, taking acid because you could find yourself in a room forever you know uh so that's not the case with ketamine but it really does reflect what 
that mansion is exactly what I aspire to create in a book. Uh, a, a place of many rooms, but there is always a spire for me, a church-like spire atop the mansion, even though there are rooms inside that dwelling that not even God visits, even though he created them. So I would say what the, the gentleman or gentlewoman uh, said is for the most part true. I think it is essential to overcome nihilism and cynicism. One does not want to be embittered as one draws one's last breath. That would be an affront. You know, that would be an affront. I, I love this question uh, from, from your past, from your movie past. Uh, I'm a big fan of scenes from the class struggle in Beverly Hills. Can you talk about how that project came about for you? And what was it like working with Paul Bartel? Great question, Chris. Thank you. Paul Bartel was an absolute delight, you know. Um, a, <laughs> he, uh, I just remember him, that, that kind of Hitchcockian presence, you know. He would say, oh, Bruce. And I'd say, what? What is it, Paul? And he says, I pander as I ponder. <laughs> Paul was just absolutely lovely. He was someone that I'd go to the movies with to go see a film. And he, I'd look over 10 minutes in and he'd be, he'd be dead asleep. And then he'd wake up about five minutes before the movie ended. And you'd have a conversation about the film that was incredibly accurate from his end. I mean, it, it was one of his freakish sort of, uh, you know, abilities. But that, that movie came because um, Paul was a friend and um, I was broke. And Paul asked me to write a script. He had kind of a notion of an ensemble piece, something that echoed Smiles of a Summer Night, whatever was on his mind. I was not happy with the result of the movie, you know, um, but uh, so be it. I, I just adored him and have uh, absolute uh, affection at his memory. The movie lives on, though. It doesn't surprise, it does, that surprises you. The movie sleeps on. <laughs> All right, I have a question here. Uh, these are great questions, folks. So, I mean, thank you. Um, would you say that writing saved your life? If so, how does spirituality continue to play a role in your professional and personal lives? Uh, did writing save my life? You know, it would be glib to say, yes, it did. But I don't know if, there's much, if it's meaningful. Um, you know, there are things that are imponderables, you know, and, and whether one can save one's life or whether one's life is saved by external forces or, or simply it is one's fate um, to, to be saved or not, these are imponderables to me. I would say that without uh, my, my novels, uh, um, I would be um, half dead. You know, put it that way. Uh, I, I, I have a, um, I was lucky. I am lucky because from an early age, I developed a relationship to words that was so potent that it wasn't for years that I understood um, that potency. Um, you People speak of, of having a certain capability where, uh, um, they can, uh, uh, musical sounds have colors, kinesthesia, I think they call it. For me, words had distinct personalities, letters, but words. There were words that I, I, they were like the room that God made that, but God doesn't visit. There were other words, um, that I had a visceral response to, an absolute animus, you know, and other words were friendly to me, and and I, I adored. I was, in other words, in relationships with words. Are you and, in a relationship with the same words? Well, there just certain um, certain words um, that I would never use. You know, there's this word that's now in vogue, performative, and and it it it. it, it Somehow it 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 makes me ill to hear that word used. You know, um, 
There are other words uh, like lambent. There, there's words that, that are in my tribe, let's say. And I also, um, I, I remember I mispronounced a word, fiery, in school once. And the teacher corrected me. I, I was calling it fiery. I'd never heard it spoken before. And, and I'm to this day, I mispronounce words. Um, I said to a friend, um, syllabus, you know. Um, and it, it's syllabus, isn't it? I'd never been to college, so I'd never heard anyone say syllabus, you know. So I, I, I remember that teacher, I was so ashamed and so committed to my mispronunciation of fiery that I, act, I, I was traumatized and refused angrily to, con, to, to concede. Do you know what I mean? So uh, that then became an obsession with, with writers, um, the idea of being writing a novel was impossible for me. So I discovered that Kafka had written not just short stories, but prose poems. The idea at that time of writing a short story was impossible. But Kafka had written prose poems, a paragraph long, two paragraphs long. So I slowly pulled myself, you know, uh, by that sacred rope into... Um, imagining worlds and uh and i went really from the heart you know that's why titles are so important to me and i never start a book unless i know the ending and the ending also always or most of the time has to be um heart crushing whether that's a tender act or a violent act so that's where i come from so in that sense i didn't have a choice uh, whether I was saved by writing, uh, I didn't have a choice to be anything but that. But of course, circumstances could have turned out differently. I might have overdosed and died. I might have struck my head and been neurologically impaired. You know, um, I've written about those kind of characters. So to purge myself of those fears, um, to examine the darkest part of what it's like to to be living on this tough planet. Um, a, a, a superficial read, we'll call that nihilistic or cynical. Uh, and it has all those hallmarks, but there's there's another side to that coin. And without that other side, um, I, I would I, I, I would have given up. I wouldn't have pursued it. So if it's not writing that saved your life, or if it was writing in conjunction with X, what might that X have been? I would say that writing gives me joy. So if one says that joy saves one's life, you know, I, I don't know. Would you say that um, that Malcolm Lowry, the act of writing under the volcano, saved his life? It, it may have killed him, do you know? But if one is compelled to do something in the arts and one suffers and derives great joy from it, that is a, a, a life-sustaining act it may not be life-saving, but it certainly is life-sustaining and in many cases enhancing and allows one to function amidst the debris uh, uh, of this daily world. There's that, that, I, we have to say good night on that. That's perfect. I, I second that emotion. Bruce, you're uh, a local national treasure, and I don't speak just for myself when I say that, and you're you're loved by a lot of people in this room and outside of this room. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And I just wanted to say that this book that that um, Sam and his friend Brandon Mullen published talk about a Dr. Strangelove Act. It's their first uh, publication in what will hopefully be a long string of books. And it's in the public domain. I don't think any publisher has decided, oh, Let's publish this book, which people can read for free, and, and it's a gorgeous edition, and I'm very proud of it. And um, I have, uh, will have nothing to do with with uh, anything that that comes up in terms of other editions of this book. This one I'm happy to sign. It's the first one, and it's stunning, and it's um, brought to you by my friend Sam Wasson. So thank everyone for being here. I really appreciate it. We both do. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Book Soup. Good night, LA.
Thank you both for being here with us. You didn't see we had a book flub going on while you were talking, so I'm glad it didn't interrupt the presentation, but just so everyone knows, you can click the link below. It will redirect you to our website. It does look like the wrong version, but the store is aware of what's going on, and it is it will not be the wrong version when you receive it. So please don't fret. Please order your copy of the Marvel Universe and support Bruce, and... We will get those signed copies to you exclusively at Book Soup. So thank you. I appreciate the full circle. That is pretty cool. So thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, everyone who watched. And everyone have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.